Okay, so today I want to talk about blockchain scaling, which we did touch on last session, and ETH 2.0, which is kind of like the next, uh, the, the next, not necessarily the hottest thing, but uh, the next most promised upgrade to a major blockchain network um, that has been in the pipeline for a while and hopefully will get off the grounds shortly. Um, phase one is already in testing version of it, so it is in operation now. And so we'll talk about some of the things that ETH 2.0 brings, um, which are looking to solve this scaling issue. So you may recall the blockchain trilemma. So here we have three, um, three properties of a blockchain that we would like to maintain. So scalability, decentralization, and security. And we want all three of these to work together in our blockchain. And so the trilemma says that, well, actually, uh, once you optimize for any two of these three things, you're compromising a third one, right? So for example, if you want to optimize for security and for scalability, well, you can have a secure system that scales a lot, right? Think about something like Facebook, maybe hard to hack and has you know a, a billion users, um, but it's not at all decentralized. So it sacrifices that component. And if you think about Bitcoin, you know it's very secure, never been hacked in over 10 years. Uh, and it's very decentralized, somewhere greater than 10 or 20 or 50,000 nodes. Um, but in terms of scalability, there's a limitation there. And so Ethereum also fits into this security decentralization, tick, tick, but scalability is left for future designers and coders to solve. Uh, so again, let's look at just at scalability for this session. So what is scale? Well, basically, we mean in a decentralized open system, you want to onboard more users. So that's pretty normal. Build an app. You need someone to use it because uh, those users at the end of the day are going to pay for the app itself, right? Uh, maybe a little bit different in a decentralized version, but still you want more users. Uh, those users are going to want to use the system, and they're going to need transactions. Uh, and so definitely in terms of Bitcoin and Ethereum, you know, we call transactions any data transfer on the blockchain. Um, in terms of Bitcoin alone, that always means a value amount. So transacting in some sats or Bitcoins that, you know, map to real world value. So that's what, why they're called transactions. Um, but really, it doesn't have to be money, right? It could be any data moving around. Uh, and these transactions and users, they, they don't have to be people, right? Users definitely don't have to be people. Autonomous users, there's bots all over the web these days, and that's only gonna increase. So those are still considered users. And of course, those bots wanna transact um, as well. And so you may think that there's enough room for transactions at present usage, but by the time you start to incorporate some of this autonomous transacting uh, environmental behavior, and the transactions, you know, have many orders of magnitude still to grow uh, in order to really bring about a, a blockchain revolution. A sort of a use case I like to think about is imagine uh, that most of the cars on the planet are uh, self-driving or hooked up to some network. Um, so, you know, some of the cars now can do that, but imagine that most of them are, how many um, vehicles we would have. And then think about something like a car interacting with its environment. And so that interaction could involve a transaction, could also involve a micropayment of some sort, um, whether it be stealing some electricity from a neighboring vehicle that has more, or from some grid component, uh, or it could even be you know, transacting with another car um, uh, in order to, say you wanna get through a traffic jam, you might wanna have your vehicle pay off the other vehicles to get out of the way so that you can speed through the traffic uh, a little bit faster. Um, uh, you know, all sorts of scenarios you can dream up which could involve more transactions. Um, and of course, whatever you dream up, uh, whether it be your autonomous car or, you know, paying per second of YouTube that you watch or paying per word of an article that you read, uh, that all needs to be packaged into a block and published to a blockchain. So in terms of blocks, 
Um, the scalability debate says, well, you can have a bigger block, so you can put more stuff more into the block itself, okay? And that's, that's okay. Eventually, your blocks get so big, they get to be like gigabytes in size that they're difficult to move around the network. So, okay, so let's limit the block size, uh, but speed up the block time. So if time is on the x-axis here, right, sort of between block n minus 1 and block n, we've got some fixed amount of time or some average amount of time. Well, you could speed that up. Um, and you say, okay, uh, but then you also get into a bottleneck where if the time is too small, then you don't have enough time to transfer the information to flood all the nodes. So you kind of have, uh, these are kind of like knobs the developers can tune and say, oh yeah, well I want a fast block time. So Ethereum might be every uh, 15 seconds, all right? But you can't send heaps of data in that time because you want it to spread to the whole network. So you, you have a, a trade-off in both directions. And that's kind of where blockchains have been for a few years now. So we saw this graph or this uh, table before of transactions per second, right? So here we are, Bitcoin's at seven approximately, Ethereum's at about 10. Uh, the marketing here for Bitcoiners, they say everything is fine. I don't wanna change anything, you know, it's too risky. Let's, let's not touch it, it, it works fine. Um, Ethereum comes along and says, well, no, hang on, we've got ETH 2.0 coming, but it, it's always been coming. Um, and so Ethereum is still stuck at 10, and lately it's been very, very busy and full. Uh, Litecoin can get through a few more transactions, uh, but if you look at the data, not many people are using it. One transaction every three seconds since 2017. So if it can hold 50 transactions a second, you know, where are the users? They're just not there. Um, and then the, the new column here, the, decentra or the centralized column, says that we kind of have a trend going here. The higher the TPS, the more centralized the system. So definitely PayPal, Ripple, and Visa are all centralized. And centralized technology is kind of matured in the sense of you know, social networks. They're very good at processing lots of data, lots of tweets. Um, and behind the scenes, they have massive amounts of infrastructure. And of course, it costs a large amount of uh, capital expenditure to build up and maintain that infrastructure. So obviously, we, we want the trend here to be we want the trend here to be centralized, can still go in this direction with big TPS claims. So some ways to go about this, um, I've sort of split it into three bins, and we'll talk a little bit about each of these, um, beginning with the one in the middle, the state channel bin. So we've got storage, state channels, and side chains as uh, three categories. And these are all, these aren't theoretical proposals. These are all real things that are being done right now to improve scalability. So let's start with uh, the Lightning Network. And uh, Raiden is a similar technology for Ethereum, but we'll just talk about um, Bitcoin. So the Lightning Network is a state channel. And uh, that means that you could think of a state channel as kind of running in parallel to the main chain. So if, if your main chain is going like this and your blocks are going up the block height, your state channel can run in parallel and at any time it can move over okay, and interact with the main chain. Um, but that's it. Without the main chain, the state channel sort of breaks or does not get anywhere, does not exist. Okay, So it's, uh, I guess, authorized by the state. The state of Bitcoin authorizes the Lightning Network. Um, and it's designed just for that purpose. So let's go through um, the, the top level overview of how the Lightning Network um, can, can transact. So here what we're gonna do is we have, these are two way payment channels, okay? So Alice can pay Bob and Bob can pay Alice. That's what these two lines represent. And then similarly, Bob can pay Carol and Carol can pay Bob and all the way through. So the payment route here is going to go from Alice to Eric. So the scenario is that we're going to say Alice owes Eric for dinner, right? So a relatively innocent expense. You go out with friends. Someone picks up the tab, and 
uh, everyone wants to pay the friend either now or sometime in the near future, right? So not a massive expense. If it was you know, a massive transaction, Alice would probably go out of her way to pay Eric directly. But let's uh, take this idea of something fairly innocent, just going for dinner or something like that, right? Or, oh, you gave me 10 bucks, I'm gonna pay you back, so, something like that. So Alice needs to find Eric in the network and the Lightning Network is going to enable her to route the payment through Bob, Carol, Diana, and Eric. So there's a lot going on here, but it's actually an excellent picture from uh, the book Mastering Bitcoin. And so we'll just, we'll just go through it. So given that scenario, first of all, Eric is going to invoice Alice, right? Now, if it's just you out with friends, you don't need to send an invoice. You just say, hey, can I have that $20, right? When you code everything up though, you better be pretty formal about it. So Eric sends, that's step one. Eric sends Alice an invoice. And what he's gonna do is he's gonna include a secret that only Eric knows. Now he's not gonna send the secret, but he's gonna hash the secret and then send it through, right? So a hash is a one-way function. So you can't unhash something, but once you receive the secret value, you can verify it, all right? So just like a digital signature, okay, you can verify it, but you can't undo it. It's a, it's a one-way thing. So Eric sends Alice the invoice. Now, Alice owes, let's say it's one Bitcoin. You can tell the date on when this was made that we were just sending one Bitcoin. Uh, now that would be a massive transaction. Uh, maybe you're sending 0 0.001 Bitcoin. So Alice is going to send Bob 1.003, and she's going to... Bump, bump it up a little bit more. She's gonna pay more than necessary, and that's going to be a fee that's included. All right, so if you wanna use a third-party provider, you probably need to pay a fee. So she's gonna send a little bit more here to Bob. And now what happens is that Bob receives 1.003, but he can't just take the Bitcoin and run away or, or disappear, right? So Bob's gonna hold the 1.003, and then what he's gonna do is he's gonna invoice Carol and he's gonna send Carol 1.02. So the difference here, so now Bob has outstanding from Alice, 1,003, and he's sent to Carol 1,002. So the difference is one. And that one he gets to keep. All he has to do is wait for the routing to happen and then that's his fee. That's his, um, that's his fee for participating and providing a channel in the Lightning Network. Uh, and then moving along, Carol's gonna do the same thing. She's got 1002 coming in from Bob, and so she sends Diana 1.001. Um, and same thing, Carol has to wait in order to receive the 1.002. So this is kind of like accounts receivable and payable in accounting. Um, Diana will do the same thing to Eric, and then once Eric gets his 1.0, which is exactly what he invoiced Alice for, he's gonna be satisfied and then to unlock the payments, he is going to send the secret back. So step six, remember he, he was the only one that knew the secret. He's gonna send it back and then everyone can verify the secret. And once they verify the secret, then they can unlock the payment all the way along the way. And everyone gets 0 0.00123 for the total fees. Um, and that makes it all the way back uh, to Alice to release the original transaction that she sent to Bob. Okay, so there's quite a few steps here, just in this sort of four or five hop route, there are you know nine steps, but you get the idea that this can be extrapolated into a whole network. And so what people do in the Lightning Network is Eric opens a channel, and so he has to commit some funds to that channel, and he would con commit funds between himself and Diana, and that's a payment channel, or Eric might also have a channel open between himself and maybe some local hub that um, has a lot of payment channels. Now the, the downside here is that you have to commit your funds to the payment channel. And this is all in parallel. This is off the main Bitcoin chain, so Bitcoin's ticking along. All this Lightning Network is buzzing. Okay, there's no, there's no mining, there's no uh, confirmation time in the Lightning Network. All this back and forth happens at network speed. So it's very, very fast, just like sending uh, a WhatsApp message, okay? It happens very fast. Um, and then 
when everyone is done, so if all the people here want to exit, then what they're going to do is close all their channels. And then when you close all your channels, you settle back onto Bitcoin and um, take away whatever you had left. Okay, so whatever the remainder is. And um, nobody can dispute what's happening in the Lightning Network because both parties have to agree to all the transactions that they send. And so it's, it's quite clever technology. Uh, it was sort of proposed, I think, in 2014. And in 2018, the number of nodes on the network started to, started to increase. So here's some of the activity. Uh, so we can see here the number of nodes has been growing pretty steadily in the last couple of years. Uh, it's not massive, but it, it is growing. Uh, and the number of Bitcoins that are locked up, so the capacity here on the right uh, is saying how many Bitcoins are, if you add up all the payment channels, and so, you know, something like a thousand Bitcoins or uh, $16 million, depending on the day. I just pulled this a few days ago, so it should be up to date. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's not, it's not peanuts, there's nothing to sneeze at, but it's not, um, you know, like the total value transacted in other networks. So it's still relatively, relatively small. And some people would argue that the growth hasn't been, you know, hasn't been uh, exponential enough like you should see in new networks that really catch on. Um, but keep in mind, this is all run by, just like Bitcoin, it's all run by volunteers, basically, people dedicating their time just for the good of, uh, of the network. And so just like Bitcoin, you can open up a node and run your own node. You can open up your own payment channel and you can start collecting fees. You can start collecting you know, the 0 0.01, whatever it may be, um, for opening a payment channel. Uh, so all that transaction activity helps with uh, helps with adding transactions to the total network, and that's called a, a state channel. So next up here are side chains, which are a little bit a little bit different. So two examples here: Polkadot. So that's an independent blockchain, but it has the ability to interact with other blockchains. And so actually, on Polka, through Polkadot, you can publish an Ethereum contract uh, written in Solidity and they can run, uh, they can interact with the Ethereum virtual machine uh, among, among some other things. They also have their own implementation. I think I mentioned Polkadot a few weeks ago as well. Um, a, side chain, a side chain solution for Ethereum includes Plasma and Rollups. So I should have put Ethereum here as well for, for Rollups. Um, and uh, these two technically are a little bit different from side chains, but we won't get into, into those details. I mean, uh, Plasma is technically a little bit different, but we won't get into, into that details. So let's look at kind of a diagram here. Uh, so this is not, not my diagram. This is from a project called near.org. Um, but it does kind of give you an idea, at least of the difference. So we said that a state channel was in parallel. So a side chain, you could kind of think of as its own independent blockchain, okay? So its own blockchain, and then it periodically, we can see some dashed lines here. So periodically, this block is going to check in with the main chain and publish a snapshot. And again, it looks like this one's going back here and publishing a snapshot. This one publishes a snapshot there. Uh, so a block hash snapshot onto the main chain. Uh, now this side chain, it can do whatever it wants. So here we have a fork in the side chain and the side chain can have its own consensus mechanism, its own block time. And one of the issues with a side chain is that it can stop producing blocks. So if we have a fork here, um, chain with the A could stop producing blocks and then if you need to settle up back on the main chain, you might not be able to prove the exact transfer of resources in order to settle back on the, on the main chain. Uh, so this is one of the ongoing issues with, uh, with side chains. Um, and there are many sort of examples out there for different, different blockchains um, as a way. Basically, the idea for all of this is to get some of the activity off of the main chain. So you want to leave 
the main infrastructure as it is. Um, and if you have any growth that you want, you want to do it off chain. Um, but you still want to use like the security of the Bitcoin network and you still want to use the decentralized properties of Ethereum. Uh, so you want to check back in occasionally. So Plasma looks a little bit different because here we have our main chain, A, B, C, D, E. And then Plasma, these are called child chains, okay? And so you can see here kind of like this Merkle tree structure um, that's attached to every block. And then down here we have some transfer between Alice, Bob, and Carol. And so we're going to have, you know, sort of three blocks to make the transfer and then one to settle back on chain. And so the the difference here between Plasma and Sidechain is that Plasma checks in every single block with the main chain. So even though these are called child chains, uh, they check back in every single block. So if you have a dispute, you can always go back to the main chain and you're never more than one block out of sync, I guess you could, you could think of this as. Um, and so it's much easier using a strategy like this for Carol to exit and keep her assets on the main chain, whereas on the side chain, you could have some tricky type of um, tricky type of exit strategy in order to sort of claim back your funds. So to claim back your funds in the Lightning Network, you know, Eric and Diana agree to close their channel, and then they have to spend one transaction, whatever they have left, to go back to the main chain. So that's a little bit different. Um, in that sense, but the the point remains is that you've got some off chain activity, and then occasionally you need to cross back into the main chain. And we, and the idea of the main chain is only because Bitcoin and Ethereum are the most popular ones, or you know whatever whatever network you're choosing to peg or base um, your assets on. Okay, so sidechains also include this idea of rollups. And these are uh, probably more on the new side, more of the, at the bottom there I say, more of the bleeding edge stuff are, are rollups. Basically, a rollup says, you know, you can literally roll up a bunch of transactions into one and publish that one to the main chain. So exactly kind of like what we've been thinking about already, you're going to aggregate a bunch of activity, but instead of doing it one by one on the main chain, which is what you have to do you know, on Ethereum, and when Ethereum is busy, you could be at 10 or $20 per transaction. Same thing with Bitcoin. Instead of doing it that way, um, an optimistic roll-up, so there's two varieties here that you hear of, an optimistic and a zero knowledge, a ZK rollup. So the optimistic one says you're gonna outsource your contracts, and these are both for Ethereum, so we're thinking smart contracts here, to a layer two aggregator, okay? So you, instead of sending your contract to Ethereum, you know, I'm gonna send it to you, and because this is your business, you're going to collect all the contracts, take a bond, which guarantees that you publish them, uh, and then you're going to pay the gas fee in busy times and guarantee that that um, bundle of contracts gets published on, on the main chain. Okay, so an aggregator rolls them up, pays the gas, and, uh, and publishes them. Okay, and so, I mean, uh, I think that's pretty straightforward to get your, get your head around. Um, the implementation of both of these things is maybe not as, as straightforward. Uh, and those technical details are left to people that really want to dive into um, some of these protocols and projects. Uh, the, the second variant here, which proves to be, or is claiming to be, is going to be better than optimistic rollups in terms of scalability, is going to be ZK for zero knowledge. And so we talked about zero knowledge proofs earlier. The idea is that you can prove that you know something without actually having to disclose the, the uh, the data or the source um, documentation that you know it. So you want to be able to prove what happened off chain. So in our dinner analogy, you want to be able to prove uh, that Alice and Eric went for dinner and they each owe each other X and Y. All right, that was off chain. And then if there's a dispute, 
okay, you need to be able to have the proof to rely on, so you want to store that proof activity on the main chain. But instead of, instead of storing that whole uh, payment uh, route you know, through Carol and Bob and Eric, which could be a three or four thousand different transactions, instead of storing that, we're just going to store the proof on the chain. And so if you're just storing one piece compared to many, you have an immediate gain in efficiency there. Um, and so what you're going to do is create a proof, uh, and you're basically just going to be storing something like a hash on the chain. So it's much smaller and much more efficient uh, with the idea of reducing the data on chain. So remember, everything on chain is only ever accumulating, and this is kind of like an ongoing, an ongoing issue that uh, developers and designers are going to have to deal with moving forward. Right? The, the networks or the, the chains themselves aren't getting smaller. As more people come on board, the chains only build. You've got this mound piling up. So if you can reduce the data that you store from the beginning, then that's going to make things better in the long run. Uh, now again, the, the details of how to implement this uh, are tricky because you have to create a proof, uh, and this is cryptographically speaking, you have to create a proof, and that can involve um, a lot of computation and a lot of time. So rather than just being able to instantly send it over the network and have it, um, uh, you could involve you're going to need some computing resources in advance to create the proof, uh, and that might be a bottleneck in itself if you can't get the proof to be small size and to be created fast enough, um, then really it might just be better to use a different, a different method. So, I mean, th this stuff is tricky, it's complex, and um, you sort of need to be a cryptographer to be working on this stuff. Uh, and the crossover between cryptography and actually building protocols is called applied cryptography. So when you can take the math and actually get it onto uh, a blockchain or into a system. And I think you know, there are very few people around um, that dig that, that deep and are building these things. Um, now, because this stuff is so new, there are heaps of estimates about the transaction throughput that these things can achieve. Um, one here says, in one of the original ZK proposals, uh, 17,000 transactions per second. Okay, this is on Ethereum. So that's a massive increase, right, from now the estimates are like 10 to 20 to 17,000. So massive, massive increase. Uh, and a recent one from Vitalik that he published early in October, so just a few days ago, said that once everything is said and done, practically you're looking at, I think, two to 5,000. I think I have the number coming up. So big improvement uh, in terms of throughput there. Okay, what about storage? Right? How do we actually handle the storage of the chain itself? Now, why is storage important? You, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like having a, a library, right? The library, nobody cares about that there's this big building with old dusty books in it. Nobody cares about it until you want to go look something up. So until you need that information, then you're quite happy that the library is there and provides you uh, this, this, this um, paper trail this chain of, uh, of documentation for you. Um, and so nobody cares um, about the old history in Bitcoin and Ethereum, right? Until you want to go back and validate some long lost transaction that now needs to be sent. Um, so it's a, it's a similar type of story here is that it's required, but on a day-to-day -day basis, you actually, it's just, it's an anchor weighing you down. So what can, what can we do about it? Well, one thing you can do about it is put it out of sight, out of mind, and you can just have a light node, so like a client running on your phone. It's not storing the whole thing, okay? Um, but occasionally, that light client is either going to connect to um, a full client, a full node, and verify what it needs to do, but it itself doesn't have the full history. Um, one, one modern and sort of like tried and true technique is sharding although the blockchain implementation of it uh, 
is, is still in progress. So sharding is a database technique, and on Ethereum, this is called Casper. So when you sort of are, when you're looking up, uh, like, or when people are talking about the different versions of Ethereum that are coming, they all have code names, kind of like, uh, kind of like Android's version all have code names, right? So Casper is the proof of stake version. So Ethereum has always had this big promise to switch from you know, energy intensive mining on GPUs to go away from that to this proof of stake system. And that's what Casper is. And uh, part of moving to proof of stake involves sharding the blockchain. Um, now ETH 2.0, the title of this lecture, uh, that's called Serenity. So a bunch of different names could mean part or whole of the, the upgrade. So sharding is just a database solution and database design you know, started in I guess maybe the 70s when computers really started to become networked together. So a you know, long time ago now. Shard is a system for highly available replicated data, okay? So it's not only a blockchain term, in fact blockchain just borrowed the term. Uh, so I got this table from DigitalOcean. So DigitalOcean is a uh, web hosting provider like AWS. And so here's my original data, data table. So you may remember this from whatever database course you took or whatever um, second year computer science where you had to implement a data structure. Uh, so this table is, this table is ranked or ordered by a unique customer ID, right? Obviously there could be many gyms and celdas, um, but the customer ID should be unique. And then you've got your info about the customer. Uh, these are records, right? Or rows in the table. So a vertical partition uh, involves taking the customer ID, copying it to a new table, okay, and then either copying or adding in a new characteristic. So this second table has to maintain a link, right? Customer ID one has to match over here. And if I were to add myself, so say customer ID five was Jeff, and I wanted to put in my favorite color, say it's pink, well, I have to do I have to make sure that five is unique and add Jeff, and then over here I have to do the same thing. I have to know that it's number five, make sure it's unique, and then add Jeff, or sorry, add um, pink. Uh, and then, you know, if you're on the SQL queries, you might have uh, some sort of join methodology here to be able to pull data from one table to the next. So a horizontal partition now is a little bit different. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut this original table right down the middle. We're gonna have two records in the first table and two records in the second. So horizontal partition two. Now we've got the identifiers and all the characteristic titles on each table, right? ID, first, last, and color, okay? But the tables, the difference here is that these tables can grow independently. So when Jeff comes along and wants to add pink, well, I could add it to HP1 or I could add it to HP2. And the data, uh, the linking between the tables isn't affected, right? So I could grow HP1, but may maybe just I connect to HP1 that day and I'm updating all my customer records and I could grow HP1, all right, and leave HP2 untouched. So now the horizontal case here is what sharding is. Okay, highly available replicated data. So it's replicated because we have all of um, the characteristics that are being copied through. Uh, now, hopefully you can recognize some issues with this horizontal partitioning scheme or a sharding scheme. And that's how do you decide which table to add your records to. So if I add all my stuff to HP2, it could get you know, big and unwieldy. Uh, so you want to have some strategy either to randomly or equally distribute your data between your partitions, um, or you might need to do some load balancing or some repartitioning, um, sorry, not load balancing, you might need to do some repartitioning of your database from time to time so that um, the idea here, remember, the, so these tables get huge, right? And you want the access to be quick. You know, if your customer has to wait a couple seconds, uh, they might, uh, not be as satisfied, and so you want the access to be quite snappy. So sharding has been around for a while, not just in 
not just in blockchains. Uh, so some notes here about sharding. Um, so Google's advertising data, so Google's ad database used to be called F1. Um, and right, uh, Google's ad data, that, I mean, that's their revenue structure, right? That's, that's their business model uh, in, terms of their, in terms of their search service. Um, so it lived in a manually sharded MySQL database. Uh, this is back 10 years ago in 2011. Right, so that meant that uh, they would have database engineers in there monitoring the system, and if one shard was growing too large or wasn't equal, they would manually redo these partitions. Um, and it took, in 2011, it took two years for them to reshard uh, the, the database. Um, at this point, it was migrated to a database called Spanner, uh, so which is a new database, and uh, so, Spanner maintains five geographically sep separated replicas, two on the west coast of the US and three on the east coast. So the number of nodes in Google's uh, database Spanner, it's only five, right? But Google centralized system um, and those databases now have uh, um, automatic resharding built into them. So as part of, the, part of their design. Um, Google also has a database called Bigtable, which also uses sharding in, in this manner. Um, so you can imagine with a blockchain, how do you want to go about sharding your, your blockchain? So by how, I mean, how do you create HP1 and HP2? So what ETH2 is planning on doing um, is sharding based on address name, so they're going to have uh, kind of have uh, bins like in a hash table and so uh, depending on the first few characters of your address you're going to go into a bin which is going to be a shard of the whole system so that's one one possible way to do it um, a way not to do it would be like to take an example is to take uh, if you're sharding the student uh, the student database here at uni one way not to do it is to take something like the first two digits of your student ID or the first three digits of your student ID and put them into a bin because then um, I think, say the student ID ha uh, is based on year. Usually there's a year code in a student ID. And so if you're coming up on 2021, then you're gonna have all your new students go into the shard with 21, for example. So that would be a way not to do it. Um, and so a way not to do it based on an address system would be if all addresses start with zero, which they do in Ethereum, is to say, oh, let's, let's put all the ones that start with zero in one shard and all the ones that start with one in another shard, right? That would be silly because it would just remain empty. Um, so deciding on how to do these shards and then actually doing it, I think that's quite a complex and tricky task. So that is in the pipeline. Okay, so what do we get out of all of this? Uh, so, so again, uh, Bitcoin, it's holding strong at seven. To, and, and the way that Bitcoin development works today is that uh, it, it's kind of like uh, watching, it's kind of like watching those rocks crawl across the salt flats and you see the time-lapse photograph of, of, them, of them moving um, because the wind is you know, pushing them millimeters a day, something like that. Um, it's, it's super slow. Uh, now, the people in Bitcoin say, hey, that's a feature, not a bug, and they're probably right at this point because Bitcoin has never been hacked. You know, in 11 years, it's been operational. It's turned out blocks you know, on average every 10 minutes the whole time. It's got the most uptime of any network humans have ever built. And at this stage, developers are like, well, let's not, let's not poke that bear. Um, not centralized, but Lightning has, I mean, Lightning has real promise here for actually being able to use Bitcoin in a fast, speedy, peer-to-peer -peer cash manner. Uh, and so 100,000, I mean, that's not real transactions settled on the chain. Right, that's just if you have enough capacity in the network and enough people connected. Um, and you could say, well, that's like real peer-to-peer -peer cash. Like in the original white paper, you could say, well, actually, peer-to-peer -peer cash means that we go out and I can hand you $5 and you can go hand that save $5 to someone else. 
right? And it costs you zero effort, um, and it costs you zero fees or next to zero fees, uh, and that's what real peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer cash, that's what we want. So Ethereum, we're at approximately 10. The marketing here is wait for ETH 2.0. And ETH 2.0, the marketing is that it's going to launch next year. Uh, so the test network for phase one of ETH 2 started in either July or August, a few months months ago. So it has begun, but there are about five phases to ETH 2.0, and we're in phase zero in a test network, okay? And for the same reasons that you don't want to break the Bitcoin network, you don't want to do something to uh, compromise the Ethereum network. So very slow incremental changes. <clears throat> so on October 2nd here, Vitalik said that if we have full rollups implemented at the end of ETH 2.0, we're looking at one to 5,000 transactions per second. The um, 2.0 version would be a different, completely different coin to ETH on Ethereum. No, because no, so you, so you don't want that because you can do that already. You can fork any protocol and make a completely different coin, right? But the problem is getting the users yeah. onto your new one. And so lots of blockchains have already um, promised improvements like this, but all the activity is still on Ethereum. So um, they, they do not want to do that. They're going to have one coin for all of them. So the way it's set out now is ETH as it is is going to be one shard. Then they're going to put in 63 other shards into the system, okay? And so that's gonna be one of the first ways to start. So you're gonna have a sharded system with ETH 1.0 as one entire shard. So obviously inefficient if you were designing from the start, but we're not designing from the start. Um, and then uh, your same ETH is gonna be the same on, on in, in any shard or on both networks, but it's all going to, it's all going to uh, be one. Especially from a user face, facing standpoint, it should all look as, as one. Uh, and will it be centralized? Well, uh, who knows? I think the idea for ETH 2.0 is they want, so ETH 2.0 proof of stake means that uh, you're gonna have validators, okay, instead of miners. And the, the number of validators they want is, it's a lot. It's up to like something like, uh, they want to get up to like 32,000 validators or something like that. And the number, the more number of validators you have, the less centralized it is, right? So all, of the, all the validators, you want them all to be on the same flat hierarchy, which means that no individual validator has more uh, influence than any other. Um, and that is how you maintain your centralization. And the way to do that is by having, you know, thousands and thousands of nodes, right? And you could think of like an apocalypse scenario where the internet gets shut down in a whole country. Suddenly all those ETH validators go offline and they're out of the game. Well, if you have a nice distributed thousands of nodes system, then you have enough people to pick up the slack elsewhere um, to keep the network alive. Cool, that's it for me for today. We are just a few minutes over.